thank you very much. And thank you to the organisers for inviting me here today. Um, as you heard, my focus is on diabetes. Uh, and this is about a study that we undertook uh, based on the electronic programme, the online programme that we had developed. So it was an independent study with ethical approval from Dublin University. Uh, and also it was supported by the Medtronic Foundation by an educational grant. So they had no say whatsoever in the study and by Hickey's Pharmacy Chain. And the reason why I'm saying Hickey's Pharmacy Chain, because this is actually checking the feasibility of using community pharmacists to enhance diabetes education using an online module for people with type 2 diabetes in Ireland. So type 2 diabetes, sorry, now I'm getting the wrong way. Type 2 diabetes, uh, for those of you who don't know, is where there is insufficient uh, amount of insulin to meet the demands. So the first protocol is to try and reduce demands on the body and therefore limiting the amount of sugar that is taken in in the diet. Uh, therefore, healthy eating becomes a key part in the management of type 2 diabetes. You also want to try and promote the use of insulin that's already in the body. So activity becomes uh, very important to enhance muscle uptake of glucose. And also then there is numerous medications to be used in the management of type 2 diabetes. But you will find that a certain number of people can be managed by just diet and physical activity alone. Uh, about another third will need medications, about another third will need to go on to injectables and there's a whole array of those. But the bottom line always is that people with diabetes need support uh, because they have multiple needs. They need information, they need support, they need to be able to address the barriers of managing diabetes when it comes to healthy eating, when it comes to physical activity and when it comes to taking medications. So all of these are done through diabetes education. So for in, in Ireland, which uh, most of you know is a small island to the west of Europe, uh, we have 200,000 people with type 2 diabetes. Already stated, healthy eating, physical activity are main components of the management of diabetes. Currently, diabetes in Ireland takes up 14% of the healthcare budget. That's much higher than the International Diabetes Federation would say for other countries. We have a rising obesity problem. Uh, in fact, we have an epidemic of obesity in Ireland, and as such, we have an epidemic of type 2 diabetes. So it is really important that we engage people as early as possible to take on behaviours that would be beneficial in the management of their diabetes. And again, that comes back down to healthy eating and physical activity and always about the management of weight. Um, so the internet offers an opportunity and there is a lot published now about using the internet. Even recording this, it'll be up on the internet for other people to hear. So it is important that we try and utilise this as much as possible. When we're talking about interactive health communication on the web, we're talking about information sharing, usually specific to one condition or generally, uh, plus decision making, plus or minus support. Uh, at the end of the day, what we want to do is perceive people help people to perceive they have support in managing their condition. We know from the Cochrane review done by Murray, and there hasn't been an updated one since 2005, which means it's, this is probably a bit dated, but it still is very much supported in all the literature that interactive online programmes are cheap, they're easy to access, uh, they can be self-paced, they do improve knowledge, and they improve this feeling that someone is out there helping them. If you feel someone has gone to the trouble of developing a module or a programme specific for you, then it stands to reason that you will feel more supported in managing that condition. At the end of the day, though, there's no actual proof that they improve behaviours. There's no actual proof that they uh, improve self-efficacy. And there's a very high attrition rate. How many of you have started an online programme? and dropped out of it very quickly. Yeah, there's a high attrition rate there, we know that. So what I came up with the idea of trying to engage healthcare professionals in order to enhance that online engagement. Uh, Diabetes Smart was uh, developed independently of this study. 
It is a one hour online education program. You can go on yourself and do it on diabeteseducation.ie. It was done in conjunction with Trinity College Dublin. There's different sections in it. And most importantly, you can track your progress. So it's self-paced. You can drop out of it, drop back in. It was developed in 2013 and it is online there for all of you to go on. It is made up of different sections and the there's five main sections in it. There's the general understanding of diabetes and that's done with videos. It takes about five minutes and most people, when they understand what's happening with their body, they may engage better in the management, self-care um, behaviours that we want them to undertake. There's a lot about healthy eating because I already have mentioned umpteen times healthy eating is the cornerstone in order to steady the flow of glucose into the bloodstream by controlling the sugar intake and therefore a healthy eating diet is the diet for people with diabetes. So there's about 10 minutes on that in this programme. We'll come back to that in a moment again. Exercise, equal importance, so we've another 10 minutes of that. Then there is about 10 minutes on the um, diabetes medications because there is such an array of them and people will always wonder why Joe is on something and that's working for him but I'm not on it. So there is quite an extensive section on that. And then just to ensure people know why they're taking on these self-care, there is an aspect of um, the, on what happens if glucose levels are high over a period of time. The programme is done through a series of quizzes uh, like answer yes or no to a question such as um, is there, um, sorry, how much would orange juice raise your blood sugar level? Many of you think, would orange juice affect your blood sugar level? Yeah? So. Yeah, yeah. I'd be surprised the number of people with diabetes who think orange, that's fruit, no, there's no sugar in that, that's fine. So mm -hmm. it's simple things, um, there is records in it, how much fruit have you eaten in the last three days? How much veg have you had today? Simple things that people can go through, answer the questions, and then they can download and print off the results so they can see what they're actually getting right or wrong. Because every time a wrong answer comes up, uh, the correct one is actually a sentence long. And every time a right answer comes up, there's a further little explanation of why that answer is right. There's videos on it because we want to change around. We don't want people doing the one thing all of the time. So there is videos. And whereas I have shown here on this, sorry, um, on this here, this zooms into the different parts while there is a speaker giving more information about it. And then, of course, at the end of each section, there's a knowledge quiz, just so people can know where they are. So for this study, what I wanted to do uh, was utilise pharmacists. Now, there's 6,000 pharmacists in Ireland, and we know they're underutilised. They want to take more of an active part in healthcare. I'm presuming this is the same in other countries, is it? Is your pharmacist considered part of the medical team? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Like in Ireland, we would consider the pharmacist to be the most accessible healthcare person to an individual on the street. You have a pharmacist in every high street uh, and there is a qualified healthcare professional there, the pharmacist, every time the pharmacy is open. So they are the most accessible. We know they're underutilised. Uh, we know they know their clients. We know they have a database of who, what and where. Uh, so they're ideally placed to undertake and deliver some uh, diabetes education. As it sounds, independently of this study, Diabetes Ireland does do clinics in pharmacies and we do deliver structured education in pharmacies. When I mention the word structured education, and many people are familiar with what I'm talking about. Structured education? So, you're familiar with it? Yeah. No, okay, so when I say structured, basically there is a clear uh, philosophy behind it. You have a set curriculum uh, and you have goalposts at either end of it. So if someone says to me they have attended the CODE programme or the EXPERT programme or the Desmond programme, I know their structured education programmes on diabetes. I know what has been covered in them. I know what the basic information that they should have received. And if I need to investigate a bit further, the curriculum is well published 
so I can go and see, has that been covered as part of it? It means that another healthcare professional knows what level of information has been delivered. It's another question how much information has been taken up by the individual, but that's part of the assessment. You know what has been delivered, and then you can assess to see how much of that has been uh, understood and undertaken on a daily basis. And from that, it is very telling on what the person needs. So this feasibility study was done with Hickey's pharmacy chain. Um, the hypothesis being that the delivery of diabetes education through an online portal, which was Diabetes Smart, supported by local pharm pharmacies, is feasible and it empowers people with diabetes to improve daily diabetes self-management behaviours. So because this is only a feasibility study, there is only 100 participants in it. So that was a random selection of pharmacists and the pharmacies actually at local level then randomly selected 10 people to take part. The pharmacy uh, is, pharmacist in a pharmacy in Ireland is supported with pharmacy technicians and they all receive training about this course. So it was open to everyone over 18 years of age, previously diagnosed with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, having internet access and having good English. And I presume, as with other countries, ethnicity is an issue in that we would have people who may not be able to understand English at the level that this programme is pitched. So that was an important uh, criteria for entry into the programme. So the study involved both process orientated in terms of the biomedical quality of life, empowerment and knowledge, but it also was participant orientated. So that means it's qualitative as well. And that's to get an, an idea and a view from individuals about their experience of using the programme and their experience of interacting with the pharmacists at local level. So the process orientated really uh, boiled down to being the biomedical, which is the A1C, cholesterol and weight. A1C, you're familiar with what that is? It basically is your goalpost for diabetes management in that your A1C should be less than 40. If you don't have diabetes between 40 and 48, you would, might have pre-diabetes. Once it's above 48, you're diagnosed with diabetes, be it type 1 or type 2. And the target always is to keep your A1C as low as possible. So it is a, an important marker in the management of diabetes. Cholesterol, obviously, because diabetes is closely linked with cardiovascular conditions, cholesterol needs to be as low as possible. And you'll find most people with type 2 diabetes are on statins. Whether they need them or not is a separate debate. And there's a lot of research going on around that. And 80% of people will be overweight with type 2 diabetes. That weight contributing to the less optimal management of type 2 diabetes, hence the promotion of weight loss where appropriate, so weight was measured as well. Quality of life was measured using the WHO5, which basically is five questions, and it is well uh, used in diabetes, probably is most widely used in diabetes than anywhere else. Empowerment was using Anderson's diabetes uh, self-efficacy score, and we used the short form there, the eight questions. And knowledge was a quiz to, uh, which was true or false answers. It also, as I stated, was participant orientated. So there was options for experience and feedback, both in open questions at the end of the questionnaires, but equally from the pharmacists uh, as the people were going through the programme. So results wise, 108 people uh, took part. Remember, we said we'd start off with 100 because this was a feasibility study, but no one was refused entry. They were predominantly male, which is unusual because most often it is females that come forward to um, look after their health. Uh, I, here it was males was predominant, but that actually probably reflects the higher incidence of diagnosis of type 2 diabetes in males. And obviously, if you're newly diagnosed with something, you seek out information about it, so it may account for that. 82% were Caucasian and the other were um, of American, uh, African, Asian origin. Uh, average age 58 plus or minus 10 years. 
30% uh, in their 50s, 40% in their um, 60s, 10% in their 70s. So uh, probably a reflection of the general profile of people with type 2 diabetes. And most of them had diabetes for around the nine years. Three quarters of them had concurrent illness and that was most oftenly, often named as cardiovascular and that would be quite standard with people with type 2 diabetes because even if they don't have diagnosed cardiovascular problems the very fact that they're on antihypertensives and anti um, stat uh, statins they presume they have a cardiac condition and 81% was on oral medications. Now that would be much higher than any of the other studies on much larger databases that I have done. But I would say this is because we were going to pharmacies and therefore all the people who are attending pharmacies are going to be on medication for some condition. So results, knowledge, six, um, average of six out of 12, really of concern that a lot of people, about a quarter of the people, had poor knowledge, and only about half the people scored over eight, which means they had a reasonable knowledge. Now, these were very simple questions. Again, going back to the orange juice, uh, does it affect your blood sugar? Do you have, are you allowed to take alcohol? Is it safe to smoke? Very, very basic questions on diabetes. So it is of concern. And obviously, we looked more closely to see, was that uh, related to anything? And yes, it was related to ethnicity. And again, I suppose there is the issue there of understanding. Quality of life, the mean was 62, 16 out of 25. But a quarter of the people would need to be actually um, assessed for depression based on the scores of that quality of life, WHO score. We wouldn't be doing that, but all of these individuals did get letters and inv inviting them to talk to their GP or their diabetes team about how they felt uh, and to bring along a copy of the WHO5, which we actually supplied again to those individuals. When it comes to empowerment, the mean score was three, uh, well, almost four. So in actual fact, most people had a good belief in their own ability to manage their diabetes and to address the barriers to what was managing their diabetes and also to seek support when they needed to. So as regards the biomedical markers, the body mass index 32, uh, this is high, but it, it does reflect the proportion of people who are very overweight. In fact, there was less than 5% who were of normal weight in this cohort. That's probably higher than you would consider for a cohort of people with type 2 diabetes. But again, reflects that these were people who were on medication. And you all know that if people are on medication for diabetes, it is a vicious circle. It's more difficult to lose weight the more medication you're on. And in fact, some of the medications will put on weight, although some of the newer ones are uh, to enhance weight loss. But the bottom line is, if you're used to having high glucose levels and you go on a medication that brings those levels down below the renal threshold for glucose, then you actually have more glucose available to the body and hence the reason why that weight loss may not occur. The mean A1C level, remember I said that we were looking around the 50s, the target to keep it as low as possible. So only 46% of people were in target. Now I will accept because we have an older cohort here that many of the people at target of 53 would be too um, low maybe a target of 58 might be more appropriate. But remember I said 10% of these individuals were over 70. They all would be uh, a target of 58. I don't know them individually, but based on natural progression, one would like to keep their target a bit higher. However, it is of major concern that there's only 46% of these uh, individuals in target. But again, that reflects very much other uh, jurisdictions. And the ADA recently published, uh, and they would have said around 60% only reaching target. When it comes to cholesterol, the most important cholesterol to be looking at is the low-density lipoproteins. And again, many of these were in target, 86% of them. But of concern is 12% were outside of target. And not only outside of target, they were way above target. So the target for people with uh, diabetes for a total cholesterol would be less than 45 
12% of these individuals had a cholesterol greater than 5. And when you add, when you actually put the target at 4.5, it went up to 24%. All of these individuals are attending medical practitioners, and it is of concern that they are left with a cholesterol level so high. So when it came to the three-month follow-up, uh, 42 people returned, 66 people did not. No significant difference between the returners and the not returners, but based on that we only have 100 people in this, or 108 people in the sample, I would draw your attention, sorry, again, I'm on the wrong, uh, lost something here. Uh, I would draw your attention that it may be that the people who actually um, came back were younger, they had less comorbidity, and they more often had health care, private health care. So generally in Ireland, a lot of the people uh, with type 2 diabetes as elsewhere in the world would be from the lower socioeconomic groups and wouldn't have health care. Whereas you find with people who have private health care, they're much better off at managing their diabetes. Six people didn't return, 42 did. So that means we can take the pharmacy element out of this and we can just look because it, now all of these 42 people had got the same intervention, but only 23 of them did, not, did complete the online programme. Come back to that again. That's a very big dropout. For people who agreed with their pharmacists, they would undertake the online programme. They came back to their pharmacists a few times during the course of this uh, and still had not done it at the end of it. But it does mean then we can actually compare the difference between uh, the online programme in terms of outcomes because there was no significant difference between the people who did the programme and those that did not do it. 19 had completed the online programme and most people who didn't complete it said they forgot about it, they lacked the time to do it, just carelessness, didn't bother me, which is probably reflective of the apathy a lot of people have for type 2 diabetes, in that actually it's the only diabetes, it's no big issue. And that's something I, as an advocate for people with diabetes, would be constantly trying to change in terms of even government policy towards how they look on diabetes. It is taking up a large part of the health budget, it is being reflected in individuals through their healthcare professionals that di type 2 diabetes is not significant, and yet we're using 60% of that, 14% of the budget. So this actually equates to over 1 billion a year being spent on Ireland on diabetes complications. So it is a major um, problem. And yet we have, when we are offering people uh, an intervention, they're not taking it up because they don't feel it, uh, they have the time or they don't feel it's important. So out of all the people who attended the pharmacies, every one of the individuals had improved their self-efficacy. In other words, their belief in their own ability to manage their diabetes. They all had reduced weight and they all had brought their A1C down. So then we can look at what difference was there between the people who completed the programme and those who didn't complete the programme? And we see that the people who completed the programme increased their knowledge, and they, they significantly increased their knowledge. But, I'm distracted here with this. From this study then, we can get a profile of the individuals who attend pharmacies. Most often they're in their 50s. They have diabetes for eight or nine years. They manage their diabetes with oral medications. Um, they are a little bit ap ap apathetic about managing it. Only two thirds of them have a good understanding of their diabetes. Most are overweight or in fact obese. A quarter of them are depressed. Half have poorly controlled blood sugar levels, uh, leading to complications. Uh, and one eighth have hypercholesterolemia, enough to be causing cardiac events. That's the profile of the individuals then that are attending their pharmacies. What about the non-attenders, the one who didn't come back, despite the fact that they were offered uh, an assessment 
at baseline and they to end it. And when they were asked to come back, and these would have got reminders both by letter and by text, 66% didn't uh, return. That is of major concern because normally you'd only expect about a 20% DNA for appointment. Now, I will have to say the people who don't return, a lot of them I feel don't return because they haven't lost weight and they don't feel they have changed anything. Therefore, they don't bother going back to their appointment. Why would you? With the code program, the actual group education that we undertake, we found initially the same thing. We had a lot of drop-offs at the six months. So what we started doing was ringing these people and telling them that come along anyway. Doesn't matter whether you've changed anything or not. Doesn't matter whether you've lost weight. Come along, we'll have a final session and we'll see how you get on because it's only by us understanding what the issues are can we help them to move forward. So there is actually research needed there to find out more about getting people back to hospital or pharmacy appointments or engaging in their diabetes management as time goes on. Uh, there also is the need for professional education. It shouldn't be me that is telling someone that it's okay to come back even if you haven't lost weight. That should be standard uh, by all healthcare professionals, that weight should not be the bottom line because it is much more than that. Even if people haven't lost weight, they may have toned up their muscles, their cholesterol may have improved, their A1C may have improved. That is positive benefits. Weight loss is not the end factor, but unfortunately for many people on the street, it is the end factor, and that is all they see. Um, so the limitations of the study, obviously there's the sampling, how we went about getting the pharmacists uh, on board. We picked a chain because that chain agreed to support this. We trained up the pharmacists and the technicians, but it does beg the question how exactly it was by open invite, but I wonder, I wasn't there, therefore we have to look more closely at how people were picked. Uh, we had robust uh, procedures, uh, but I wonder where they followed to the T. The fact that you are dependent on other people always uh, does cause issues with any research. Uh, one would much rather have a researcher out there doing the sampling. The methodology, obviously, too, uh, because this is very much quantitative, but there was a qualitative component in it. There is a limitation because so many people didn't come back at the end of the programme. Uh, and then also that we checked uh, the quality of life and the empowerment by self-report. Uh, because this was uh, completed by the individual, you'd hope they were honest, but you cannot be sure of that. You may uh, have that... They remember what they did at the first time and look to improve it on the second. But again, it's a longer time in between. So you certainly hope, unless they had kept a copy, they wouldn't do that. Um, and many of the instruments then obviously will have issues around validity. But because we were looking on general habits, I think we can overcome that. But I must alert you to it that it does actually uh, limit the findings of this study. However, at the end of the day, this is only a feasibility study, uh, and therefore uh, we will allow those limitations to inform us that, yes, diabetes education can be undertaken by pharmacists, but the online component of it is poorly, under uh, poorly uptaken by individuals. Uh, a lot of the people who came back for the follow-up did feel more empowered. They had improved their knowledge. So it does mean that working with pharmacists does allow an opportunity. The question is, does the online add anything to that? Yes, it improved knowledge. Independent of that, the figures were too low to indicate whether it had a substantial effect on the empowerment or the quality of life. So going forward, we are engaging with the pharmacy chain and they are now looking to continue this, but independent of the quantitative part of this. And obviously that requires further discussion and another research study to see whether that works. So thank you for your time. Sorry about the hitch with the presentation. I have it here if anyone wants it. Thank you.
Any questions? Mm -hmm.